costumes and, and memorabilia, maybe we can make some kind of connection and get them to come through. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely have to try that. Definitely. Another uh, cool thing about that night was that was the first night I met Lewis, uh, Lewis O'Powell, the fourth. Is the fourth? Yes. And uh, and Blaine too, and uh, those guys are both really cool guys. They are. That was my first time meeting Lewis as well. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, he's really cool. I love his stories, and of course Blaine. I mean, come on. Yeah, <laughs> he's Blaine. So awesome. <laughs> he's you know the the first real medium I've ever met. Um, met him, you know, for the first time ever in Rockford. Uh, which is the whole subject of the Hank Blue books that I've written. Yeah. So he is a, plays a big role um, in those books and also in just my development and my path on the paranormal and learning. Um, he's been there guiding the way pretty much this whole time since 2012. So we've been friends um, for a long time. That's awesome. And he was the one who actually originally told – or told us about Seven, uh, yeah. the operator. And mm-hmm. there's also, at, in uh, in Indiana, at the uh, Revenant Acres Farm, they have some entity that, like, possesses people that goes by Seven. And I made a couple videos about that. And I mentioned that uh, there's another Seven, you know, that's a, a good Seven, and there's been times where I've called, like there was one day I said something like, I was like saying, Seven, can you uh, do something? And then all of a sudden it said Seven, like super clear. And I was just like, that's insane. <laughs> yeah, and you know, when, when I'm with Blaine and he calls for Seven, like Seven is right there, Johnny on the spot for him. Um, when I try to call for him and Blaine's not there, it's hit or miss. I kind of... yeah in the past have given up trying to call for seven I, I feel like maybe I'm I'm just not meant to use a tech, that technician maybe so um but you know but when he when Blaine's there you know seven is a really cool guy he's he he helps a lot so yeah I was definitely impressed with Blaine and uh and then you know you had Blaine and uh uh, Kat Hobson working together and so it was it was just a fun night and uh, I think we got some great footage too and everything of what all was happening mm-hmm. so south of Silicaga is where Rockford is right uh, I guess so I'm not <laughs> it's Coosa County so yeah it would <laughs> yeah be. it's kind of out there uh, mm-hmm. and it's just a small town Huh. One stop sign, one full way stop, and it, you know, it doesn't even have a traffic light, I, light, I don't think. So there's there's really nothing there except for the courthouse. Um, most of the shops are abandoned, uh, just a lot of farmland. It's really nothing to it. And so how did, uh, how did you end up getting involved in a case down there? Well, an old high school acquaintance of mine, I mean, we really weren't even friends in high school, but we um, we ended up getting to know each other because um, when I got remarried after my uh, divorce back in 2007, 2008, um, it, it was just kind of weird. When I, when I got remarried... Um, my new husband's family members knew Jenny from college. They had been like really good friends. And so Jenny was my client who had uh, moved to Rockford and um, was renting a house there with her husband. And we just kind of reconnected because of all the new family uh, connections going on there. So, um, you know, and then I learned about her son, Buddy, who has autism, which is something that I was trying to learn about because my uh, new stepson, um, who was about 14 at the time, uh, he also had autism. Yeah. And so I really didn't know much about it, and I kind of learned from Jenny, um, you know, what autism is about and some things that she had um 
recommended. So our friendship just kind of started that way. We kind of knew of each other, and then we became friends later in adulthood. And when she moved into Rockford, um, you know, she kind of started joking, like, on Facebook and, you know, on her blog that uh, she thought the house was haunted. And, um, but it really kind of took a turn for the worse, and it kind of got serious, and and she really (laughs) started to realize that there really may be something to it. Um, They only lived there in that house uh, for, they signed like a six-month lease, and they left like a couple weeks early because it was so intense and so frightening. So that's how I got, ended up getting kind of caught up into um, this Rockford case was just just through coincidence, I guess. Yeah, that's interesting. And so I remember one of the things that they noticed when they moved in the house was that the paint, right? The haint blue paint? Yeah, and of course Jenny didn't know what haint blue was. She just thought it was this hideous blue that had been painted all over the walls. I mean, and it wasn't just the walls, the doors, the hmm. uh, the trim of the house, uh, the power, you know, the power outlets and all the light switches. Yeah. It was, so, it was just so bizarre how the paint had just been, you know, was everywhere. And it was only the upstairs of the house. It was the entire upstairs was painted this way. So, naturally, the first thing she wants to do is to try to make the house her own, and not knowing that this paint blue color was a way of protecting them from um, paints, which are spirits that are believed to be caught between the world of the living and the world of the the dead. Yeah. And they're, um, they're something you don't want to mess with, but you definitely don't want to get caught up in. Um, but the paint blue paint supposedly is like their kryptonite and they can't uh, cross it so it wards off the evil haints the evil spirits and so um but she didn't know that so she painted you know whatever she wanted to over the haint blue and that's exactly when she you know had her first really weird experience it was the day that she was painting and her mother came over to give her a break and um, take care of her, her daughter, who was about two at the time. And uh, she was outside washing the paintbrushes out. And she glanced upstairs to, um, like, the master bedroom window. And she noticed that a man was, or she didn't say a man, but she just saw a figure in the window. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. And she just naturally assumed it was her mom going up there to see if, uh, you know, to see how she, she was progressing with the paint. So she, you know, she goes back inside and she sees her mom, you know, downstairs playing with her daughter and it's like, so how'd you like the, uh, you know, what I've done with the paint upstairs? And she's like, what do you mean? I haven't even been upstairs yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> and she was so sure of what she had seen that there, she just assumed someone had, someone else was in the house. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, no one else was supposed to be there, so they, you know, they panic, they run outside, and just as they're running outside, <laughs> her husband pulls in the driveway, and, and they're like, you know, Hunter, you know, someone's in the house, you've got to, you know, go check it out, or call the police, or something, I mean, they're like full-on panic mode, Wow. and, uh, you know, they check the house, and no one's there, but that was, that was the first thing, I think, that happened to her, and um, just having no idea what she had done uh, to start this all by covering up that blue paint. Yeah, that's wild. And just the fact that that, was, that paint was there and everything, like that house just sounds crazy. And I remember some of the other things that happened were just like pretty, uh, pretty dark stuff, it seemed like. Um, so... So once, so how long were you actually involved with that house? Like, how long was that case? Um, from, I think I really started talking to um, Jenny about it probably in May of 2012. 
um, I was seeing some red flags. She was talking about constant bug infestations, Mm -hmm. um, bad smells in the house, um, you know, things going missing, appliances constantly breaking, and, um, you know, just a feeling of being watched, hearing footsteps. So I, I re- you know, reached out to her and just said, hey, you know, I've got this paranormal team. You know, we could come and investigate and try to fix this or try to help in some way. And, you know, at first she was like, no. She's, you know, wasn't really into it, bad idea. But mm-hmm. a couple, couple weeks later after she had... Um, gone through a physical assault, you know, being physically attacked, her and her daughter both, by the this entity that was in this house, she finally said, okay, you've got one night, because <laughs> we're moving out, I don't want you to come before I'm out of here, but you've got one night, we're moving out, and then um, the next day, we're turning the keys in, and she said, you can come uh, this one night, and that's what we did. Um, we dropped everything and we're like, we'll be there, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, cause I really wanted to make sure that I could, um, maybe with Blaine's help, you know, fix this house so that no one else would have to go through what she went through. Um, cause we, we feel pretty certain she wasn't the, the they weren't the first family. Yeah, obviously, definitely. obviously with a hand glue paint on there. And mm. then when they first moved in, they had to throw away a bunch of the previous tenants' belongings that they had just left. It looked like they had picked up and left in the middle of the night. Yeah. So um, we're pretty sure they weren't the only ones that ever experienced this. Yeah, and just the fact that, you know, the people before that obviously had, you know, some kind of knowledge about what was going on there, like you said, with the paint and everything. Like they tried to to calm it down, but... uh. I'm not sure how much you want to go into that since it is in your book and everything uh, about like what happened on that land and everything. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk about it. Um, you know, cause of course, you know, if you want the full detail, it's all in the book. But yeah. you know, you know, I'm, I freely talk about this. You know, have <laughs> talked about this before, but um, um, you know, of course, we have. You know, we did our investigation, and, um, you know, Blaine immediately, before we even went, we even went in the, the house, he was picking up on the presence of two males that were in the house. And they thought it was, you know, just a huge amount of fun to scare people. And they were just proud of themselves for having run Jenny's family away. And... Um, he felt that they were uh, African American, mm-hmm. and um, he was picking up on a couple of names, like you know, John uh, was one of the names for sure that he picked up on. And so, you know, of course, I'm I'm pretty skeptical. I'm just kind of taking mental notes about all of this. But later, when we started doing uh, the research on the land and the house and you know, digging into the history, we came across this incredible story. And this this was years later because we found absolutely nothing initially to validate what Blaine was picking up on uh, and validate any of the things that we heard through the spirit box, et cetera, that night. But um, we finally found this story about a voodoo preacher from the 1970s who had lived, uh, we would later find out, pretty much next door to this house that Jenny's family had lived in. And he had been suspected of killing at least five of his own family members. Wow. It started <laughs> with his first wife, um, then his second wife, then it was his brother, who, by the way, was named John. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then his own nephew, and then the last one that, that he was suspected of uh, murdering was his stepdaughter. She was only 15, 16 years old at the time. And, um, you know, that was pretty much the, the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, the police in that county, the sheriffs, they seem to never be able to pin any of these mysterious deaths on, on the voodoo preacher. But... Um, 
you know, so some of the uh, people in the town finally took matters 